Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. I'm Amanda, and I am one of the content creators for Science Up First. Uh, you might see our logo there, uh, but you might not know who we are. We are an anti-misinformation initiative from the Canadian Association of Science Centers, and we work across Canada to give people the tools to do their own research and critically think if what they're seeing is true or not. Um, let me see here. Oh, I did figure it out. So this is an infographic about how we work. Uh, it starts off with misinformation being a concern. From there, the public or someone on our team might give these concerns to us. We will kind of collaborate with our group of experts, which is a bunch of experts from all across the country who specialize in different areas. We will write the articles. Once that's been vetted through usually two to three experts, my job is typically to create the posts, do the design part of it. If there's a comedy script, because we're trying to be a little funny with this stuff, uh, we might do that. That goes out to our partners and onto social media. And um, sorry, I'm not so used to speaking in a microphone. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. <laughs> Uh, once it gets to social media, we amplify it through our partners, and that gives the public access to good science. Once that happens, hopefully if people find our services useful, they'll recommend us to other people, and then when those people find things they're not so sure about, they can write us, they can DM us, uh, come to us during a talk, and we'll do our best to investigate. So that's just kind of like a rundown of who we are, how we operate. Uh -huh. So let's start off with what misinformation is. At Science Up First, we tend to use the umbrella term misinformation, mostly because it comes in good faith. As you can see there, it is false information that may or may not have bad intentions behind it. Disinformation is false information that does have bad intentions behind it. And malinformation is using the truth to make false intentions. So we call this cherry picking. If you had an article or something where you were a misinformer and you wanted to take certain pieces out of it and create your own misinformation or malinformation, you would cherry pick the little pieces and put them into something else. This can be especially harmful because you are using parts of the truth. So people that do recognize parts of the narrative might be more inclined to believe. And you might be wondering why it matters uh, talking about sp not spreading misinformation. It can be deadly, to be fully honest, and that's not an exaggeration. If you think about a topic like climate change, there's a lot of misinformation that goes along with it. Uh, one of the most popular things that you may or may not have heard is that climate change can't be real because we still get winter. And if you look outside, yes, we do indeed have a bunch of snow out there. Uh, obviously, those two things, you know, A doesn't cause B, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but that piece of misinformation, if it is taken in by someone and they believe it, could potentially influence their thoughts and actions. So they might be less likely to support climate change initiatives or things along that line. Uh, this happened during the pandemic. There was a lot of misinformation, especially at the beginning when there was so much happening, everything was changing constantly. That's actually when we became Science Up First because someone had to do something about how much bad information was out there. Uh, so, you know, there were things like those claims that heat would kill the virus. And there were people saying if you took a blow driver, sorry, blow dryer, and put it up your nose, that would, yeah, I, you know, it is, it's kind of funny. <laughs> now, you know, we're like, okay. But there were probably people that believed that, and because of those things, it caused them to ignore scientifically proven methods for containing a virus, right? So like masking, social distancing, hand washing, all these practices that have had thorough scientific testing, and we know do actually work. So that is 
maybe some very extreme examples. Obviously, not every time you share misinformation, it's going to have those consequences, but it can be a pretty serious thing. Uh, so this is a series that Science Up First does with a really fantastic illustrator named Jordan Culver out of the UK, and he illustrates all of our misinformer tactics. Now, there are a lot of misinformer tactics, and I wish I had time to go over all of them with you all today, but you'll see in the little graph I have later, there just isn't time to cover it all. So I kind of chose three examples I really liked to give you a taste. Uh, if you're interested, we have more on our website, which I have in my last slide. So we'll start with appeal to nature. Uh, humans have a natural bias to believe that anything that comes from nature is automatically better. And while a lot of times that could be true, it is not always the case. So some of you might know that apple seeds contain a pretty minimal, but a, a certain amount of uh, cyanide in them. So cyanide is, in those apple seeds, technically natural, but you know, not good for you. Uh, but you will see this a lot in uh, the health influencing realm. A lot of things will make claims about being organic, GMO free, and when you start to look into the legislation behind these, there's not a lot out there. Um, I guess there's not a, a code that they have to follow. You can put a lot of claims on packaging and not be culpable for the results of that. So that's kind of something to keep in mind. Uh, the second tactic is fire hose of falsehood. This is typically used in propaganda campaigns. And as you can see there, that hand is reaching out for help and it's being shot down by a whole bunch of water while it's already drowning in a sea of water. This is basically just giving people a barrage of information, misinformation, from all sorts of different places, the same sort of misinformation, and there's so much of it that it becomes overwhelming trying to pick out what the facts are. So this, um, some good tactics to sort of protect yourself against this, if you see like blatant misinformation on social media, report it. And just trying to, if you see a lot of things coming from different sources, but it just doesn't sit right with you, then just do a bit of research. Just go a little bit further with it and see if these claims actually do have any sort of backing to them. We'll get into the kind of methods for that in a little bit here. Uh, the third one is one of my favorite illustrations, and it's the causal fallacy. This is the idea that A equals B. So the rooster crows, and because the rooster crows, the sun comes up. <laughs> and I think that, yeah, I think you guys understand. Uh, but the interesting thing about the human brain is uh, we try really hard to connect the dots. So um, a lot of times, and like I put up there, you know, we're all susceptible to misinformation at various points in our lives. My team is definitely not exempt from it. And we have a good laugh sometimes about the misinformation that we might share with each other that'd be like, wait a second, I did not check my sources on that. So yeah, it, it, there are a lot of um, shortcuts our brains take. So if you do get kind of tricked by a piece of misinformation, it's not always this obvious, so don't feel bad about that. Uh, so one of the people I really like that works in this field is Sander van der Linden. He is a professor at Cambridge and writes some really fantastic books about misinformation. He has listed these six degrees of manipulation, and basically these are six different, I don't really want to call them tactics, uh, six different approaches, I guess, maybe that's kind of the same word, but six different things you can look for when you're looking at a piece of media to kind of analyze if it might be misinformation. You start with the emotional. You really want to see if an article is using emotional language because it can appeal to a part of us that's not so logical. As most people know, if you're kind of in a rage or if you're a bit scared, you're probably not thinking with your most logical self. So that is often exploited in misinformation to make people act without thinking. Impersonation is the second one, and that could be impersonating an expert or impersonating an organization, depending on how it's done. Uh, so there are a lot of people out there that 
might seem like experts, but when you do a background check on them, they have no background in what they're speaking about. They're sometimes just like a, I guess you would say a bad actor. Someone that's put up in a suit and made to look credible to speak half-truths or non-truths. Uh, to impersonate an organization, what often happens is, uh, let's say there was a science misinformation organization, and they wanted to get traction, and they, so they got their website together, and they studied NASA, and they said, okay, well, NASA's using these colors, these fonts, these symbols, they write in this style, and they can get really intricate in how they mirror a reputable source, and so they might impersonate that, and because you're looking at that, and maybe you've seen the NASA website, our brains aren't as critical because there is something there we recognize. So that can be a pretty bad one. Uh, polarization, I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Just kind of dividing people into two sides because when people are fighting, they don't have time to come together and have a conversation and hear what each other has to say. So that one is often used in politics. I mean, these are used often in politics, but in a lot of other places as well. Any time that there's a slant to an article, and it seems like they're trying to divide people, ask yourself why that is. Uh, trolling, I'm sure most people <laughs> have seen an, you know, a post and then made the mistake, the terrible mistake of reading the comments, right? The comments are usually a place where nothing good happens, and that's because there are things called troll farms. I only recently learned about this. It is just hundreds of human beings going on to all these controversial topics on these posts and making very inflammatory comments, trolling for people that they can get kind of just, you know, a little bit confused, angry, emotional. So if you start to see someone that's like saying some real uh, controversial things in the comments, they might not even be a real person. They probably don't even care about that topic. They're probably being paid to do this. Uh, conspiracy, that is, you know, like conspiracy theories. We're probably all familiar with things like the flat earth theory that there's a certain point where you will just drop off the side of the earth because it is in fact not round. And there are like a lot of other ones and sometimes, occasionally, a conspiracy theory can prove to be true, like Watergate. Uh, but more often than not, it is just not. Uh, it, there's often a narrative of bad actors in these shadow organizations that are controlling everything. And the appeal of it is if you're feeling scared and you're feeling out of control, and I mean, the last few years, it's been pretty scary. So if you're kind of desperate to have something to blame or some reason for it, then it is so easy to just grab onto these, right? Uh, and the very last one is discrediting. That one we see all the time in politics. It's the smear campaign. It's um, not getting into the policies usually, it's getting into the person's own character. And so if you ever see a, a, like a character attack without any seeming cause, you might wanna look further into that because it's probably a manipulation tactic, you know, for whatever it is. And I'm, I'm not saying that one party does this more than others, but definitely in politics, it's a tool that we see often on any side of the, of the debate. Okay, so now um, I was mentioning the misinformer tactics, and you can see how many of them there are, quite a few. Uh, Dr. John Cook is a fantastic researcher He's uh, from the University of Melbourne, and he invented this really, really great game called Cranky Uncle. If I remember right, I believe it's free. <laughs> and it's, it's really fun. Like it's, I, I think it's supposed to be for kids, but I went through the whole game, and I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot about misinformer tactics. And the more you can educate yourself on various tactics, you know, the more prepared you are. And the more, if you see someone you care about getting involved in a scam or falling prey to misinformation, you can explain, well, this is what's happening. And if you have kind of that actual explanation of the tactic they're using, it's a lot easier to show someone how they've kind of been taken in by misinformation. So yeah, I don't have time to go through it today, but I would highly recommend, if anyone that's interested in learning more about this, checking out his game. He's a fantastic man, and basically his life's mission is to just 
teach people how to critically think and deal with real world problems. Uh, so yeah, now we're gonna get into our best practices for debunking misinformation. So we're starting with checking our sources, and that is not super simple. There are so many things you can do to check a source. If you happen on a website and it seems a little funny, um, you wanna click out of it, so you don't wanna keep within the website to see if it's real. You wanna go to Google, try Googling it, see if it even is a real, like actual reputable website or if it's just kind of a weird little uh, pocket in the internet that gets you caught in a misinformation loop. You want to look if the website uh, has a lot of spelling errors because they really shouldn't. Uh, and little things like that. Have they ever re uh, is it redacted? The word's escaping me, but when, <laughs> when a piece of scientific evidence is proven to be wrong, I think it's redacted. Uh, it's something along those lines, but basically, um, if they've ever admitted past articles to being wrong, that's a good sign. Because with science, as we learn more, we change our opinions to meet the facts that we have. Uh, so the next one is you wanna read past the headline. That's, this is like applying the, uh, the emotional rule. Usually the, not always, but a lot of times, the headlines and misinformation can be very big, very bold. They're clickbait, essentially. And if you find a title that seems a bit sensational, maybe look a little further into that and see, see what the article actually says. Uh, you wanna research the author because it's sort of the impersonation thing. They can have people playing experts who don't necessarily know what, um, what is actually happening. You want to check the publication date because science changes. And I mean, we've done this at Science Up First before where you get this data and you're like, oh, wait a second. This is from five years ago and so it probably no longer applies. Uh, that, and then is it satire? So there are sites like The Onion, like Beaverton, and probably a lot of other ones who will impersonate real news, but for the purposes of humor instead of misinformation. And there's definitely been a time or two at work where we've had to confirm with each other if what we're reading is true or not, and if it is, in fact, satire or if it's misinformation. So that one can be a little tricky. Like, if you know the site, then that's one thing, but if you're not sure, yeah, just kind of read the tone and everything and see if it does seem like they're having fun with it or not. Misinformation versus satire, usually it's, there's a more serious tone to it, generally. Uh, and then you have to check your personal biases, which we all have, because sometimes when you don't mean to, you do end up making decisions in a way based on you know, past experiences and beliefs. Uh, especially if you're reading something about a topic where you do have a very strong opinion, that's probably the time when it's best to question yourself because it's the easiest to fall into the trap of just accepting those facts is true. Uh, you wanna check photos on a search engine to see if they've been altered. This one has kind of like a secondary part now as uh, AI or artificial intelligence starts to make pictures better than any of us could possibly make. Uh, so now it's getting harder to tell, but with uh, photos on Google, I don't have the instructions, but if you Google on Google, reverse image search, you can take any photo and you can find out the exact source of that photo. So you can see if it's been photoshopped, you can see if it's been cherry picked, and just a lot of other things. And then you wanna consult a fact checking website. Uh, you can always, if you're not sure, like I mentioned before, send us a message at Science Up First and we are happy to investigate things. There are quite a few fact-checking websites out there. Uh, we're still putting together our resource list for it, so we don't have it on our website yet. Snopes is pretty good, but it's not foolproof. And honestly, I would never fully trust any fact-checking website either because, you know, anything could happen. So it's a good place to kind of get a start, but also consider some of these other things while you're, you're doing your research. And so yeah, you just basically you wanna think before you share because if someone could make bad decisions from the information you're passing on, that's not a great responsibility to have, right? So you have to kind of go with your gut, look at your own biases, decide if it's a controversial or hotly debated topic because often those are the ones that are right for misinformation. 
And yeah, if you can stop the flow of misinformation before it goes down the chain, you're saving a lot of people. Because if you think of the old head and shoulders ad, I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it was the you tell two friends and they tell two friends. I think it was head and shoulders. Anyways, once you share something, you could have five people that see it and reshare it. And so it just, it branches out and it can get out of control if we're not careful. And so um, the last part of my talk is something that we really think is important at Science Up First, and that is having conversations with the people you care about. Uh, it can be really hard, and I'm sure we've all been in those positions where you have that loved one that just, you just can't get them to see your point. And you know, to be fair, they probably can't get you to see their point either, so you've got the kind of this, this uh, gridlock on it. So you want to do a few things if you're going to try to have any conversations with people you care about. You don't want to shame them because that's not productive. And the emotion of shame immediately shuts down a conversation because the person feels closed off. And that's the same with having your empathy first, right? Like you don't want to ever make someone feel bad for what they believe, even if it's blatant misinformation because they have their reasons why they believe that. And you're not going to get anywhere if you're just making them feel terrible about it. Uh, you want to pick your battles, because sometimes the family table as you're carving the turkey is not the best time to talk about UFOs. <laughs> Whatever your opinion on those are. Uh, so that might not be a great time to like, dive into it with everyone. And sometimes it's just that there are a lot of people around. and. Sometimes that conversation's better one-on-one, -on -one, so people can lower their defenses and not feel like they're under attack. Uh, if the conversation does go well, you can ask them if you can share some reputable source information with them, but don't just push it on them. Make sure that you get that consent, because no one likes it when someone's pushed, even if it's good information. You know, you know that person that's always giving you the articles, and it's like, oh. But if I'm asked, it's a very different thing. Uh, and then, yeah, you want to lead with your relationship because at the end of the day, you care about this person and, you know, there are more important things in life than trying to change someone's mind overnight sometimes. Sometimes it's just a slow and patient effort to see these changes. And like, there are people on my team and like within my own family uh, there have been huge changes with my family since I started, and I started to be able to compassionately explain misinformation and spotting it. Uh, people in my family I never would have expected have started to think a lot more critically, and that's awesome. But I think if I would have come in with my arms a swinging, it probably wouldn't have gone so well. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's pretty much it for me. You can kind of, this is where you can find us. Uh, I'm usually the face on the video, so you'll recognize that there. And our website's being updated, so it's pretty good right now, but it's going to be excellent in a few months here. Uh, but otherwise, I think that's pretty much what I've got, so thank you for listening. <laughs> and for those who are ready to ask some questions, please line up against the wall. We will move a little out of your way. We're real tight today. Um, no long preludes or stories. We expect respectful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, please get it to myself or Canood, any of the SACMA members at the table. And just another round of applause for Amanda for sharing and for being here. And I welcome everybody to please join me at the question answering corner. And now it's you. Uh, thank you. Hello. So they're going to come up. You're going to be here. They're mm -hmm. going to come up, oh, well, ask their question, and then go back to there. Welcome. Hi. Hello. I have to face you. <laughs> Hi, Amanda. My name is Henning Mundel. Nice and one can have long discussions with you on lots of things. It's very fascinating. I want to ask about a something that's in the news this last week. and. <laughs> Have you identify whether we most appropriately call it whether we most appropriately call it uh, disinformation or malinformation? This is the statements by Poilevre based on Danielle Smith transgender debacle from last week and plans and his statement that oh, as adults they 
have to decide whether they want um, uh, puberty blockers. As adults, there's no puberty. Thank you, that's an excellent question. Um, so yeah, we, we have been uh, sharing, resharing a lot of our gender affirming care articles sort of in response to everything that's been happening this week. It's, uh, it's an area that we really deeply care about at Science Up First. Uh, but yeah, we haven't actually directly addressed that comment yet. Uh, there have been a lot of other similar sorts of misinformation we've seen uh, in regards to that area. But um, I can definitely pass that on to our expert vetters to kind of dig a little deeper in it because unfortunately, uh, especially gender affirming care is an area that is ripe with information and it's heartbreaking because I mean, you've all seen what can happen when malinformation or disinformation gets out there and affects a certain group of already um, just, dis, I guess, disadvantaged individuals in the way that they've been treated in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Terry. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Terry Shellington is my name. And I um, appreciate your, your comments and your encyclopedic uh, unpacking of, uh, of, of, of malinformation or whichever the term is. Um, I, I just want to make an observation and have you respond to it, but it seems to me that one of the things we're facing is the um, fire hose uh, strategy. I think about the stolen election theory in the States in which it's been repeated so many times that the election was stolen that many Republicans who follow Fox News, for example, are overwhelmed by it, I think. And I think the same thing applies to the to the transgender discussion that uh, Premier Smith is um, proposing, that uh, there's such a feeling out there that transgender people are a threat to Western civilization and, um, and the root of much evil, uh, that uh, it's hard to unpack for some people that this may be just fire hose uh, strategy. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think, it's been so interesting because, um, well, we're scientists and, I mean, there are these gender variations in nature and often the argument is it's, it's against nature, but if you look at how there are so many variations in so many other species, this is a natural way of being. And so, yeah, it's... I would say definitely a lot of our political, I, I'm not allowed to speak politically, but in politics, oftentimes, yes, that is very much a big tactic that is used is the firehood, uh, yeah, false information. So I think being aware of that is a really great start because then you can start to critically think and use these other tools to figure out what the actual truth is and, and who benefits from the misinformation, which is something I forgot to mention earlier. Hi, uh, Trevor Page. Um, how is your organization funded? Who's funding it? What do you think about government regulation so we actually get the truth out there, not misinformation? And since we seem to use these, instead of uh, body language when we converse, what's your take on that? Oh, there's some good questions. Uh, let's see, well, so we are partially, we have a little bit of funding from the CIHR. Uh, we are not a government organization. We get our funding from a lot of different places. We're not technically a not-for-profit, but we are in that area, so um, we do have certain topics we have to cover a certain amount of the time, for instance, vaccination. I forget what the exact numbers are, so we do have uh, certain areas we have to cover a certain amount, but we're never told what we can or can't post, and yeah, we don't have any government influence, which I think might be sort of the question. Um, as far as government regulations, uh, it's so tricky because a lot of what we're fighting against uh, they're kind of lawless, and so 
even if there were certain regulations. I mean, they were trying to kind of choke out the news uh, on Facebook and everything, and so and on Instagram, and that all got redirected, and it was a whole big mess. Uh, but I don't know. Like, it, I'm not sure I fully know my feelings on that one. It's a very good question I'm going to have to think on. And I've also forgotten your third question. Oh, yes, cell phones and body language. <laughs> um, I'm, it's, it's weird because I do work on social media, but I do believe that technology is both a gift and a curse, and it does mean that we don't interact in the same ways as we used to, and we're not as used to reading people's body language or we don't have the opportunity because there's a screen between us. So I would definitely say that that has impacted um, how we interact with each other and probably to our detriment in a lot of ways. Laurie Schultz, um, follow up to uh, Trevor's, one of Trevor's questions um, of one of your fundraisers or fund funders. Um, who is the CIHR? I think. And um, my question is whether or not your um, Science Up First has made any steps to collaborate with uh, the school systems um, to do some um, you know, education on critical thinking um, for, for young, young people. Thank you. Thank you very much for pointing that out. I often forget that the acronyms that we always say are like not public knowledge. So uh, the CIHR is the Canadian Inst Institution of Health Research. So a lot of the information you receive about vaccinations and that sort of thing is uh, coming from them. And then in the second part of the question, that is actually one of our missions we're working on right now is to prepare educational packages for school-aged children as well as in the universities. And because you would have to have slightly different approaches depending on the age group and that sort of thing. So yeah, we really do want to get into that hopefully this year. If not, it's definitely on our mission for next year, fingers crossed. But misinformation just keeps popping up, so. You'll be in business forever. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Knut Peterson. Uh, thank you very much for your very informative talk on facts. Uh, on that note, we hear all kinds of things about what AI can do. Uh, do you see AI? playing a role in fighting against misinformation? That is an excellent question, especially since I sort of didn't add a lot of AI into my talk, but it is an area that we're um, starting to delve a lot more into because obviously it's becoming rapidly becoming more prevalent. Uh, in theory, <laughs> like we have just as an experiment, we've used ChatGPT, which is an automated AI system that you can ask questions to or pretty much ask anything and it'll give you this written out response. So we've tried it with uh, writing articles for us and it gets it pretty spot on and like any tool, it definitely could be useful in spotting misinformation, uh, but <laughs> there are a lot of problems with it because it's a great tool for misinformers as well. Um, so I think like we're still trying to figure out the implications for us and for informing people and helping people really pick these things out. Um, but y yes, <laughs> with the caveat that I am personally very suspicious of AI and I am concerned about how it could be used by people with uh, ill intentions. But that's a personal opinion. Thank you. I'm Ian Hurdle. Um, I have a sister and brother-in-law that live not too far across the U.S. border. And four years ago, uh, one of them has two health degrees and another has a science degree. And they said, come on over and visit. And I said, you're 30 kilometers from the case, first case of COVID in the U.S. No thanks. So my problem is even if we try to educate people, 
Science is very wobbly. It doesn't move in lockstep gears. It goes back and forth. And I think it's this uncertainty that allows a lot of the malinformation to spread. Comment, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. And that is part of what makes our job so hard is that facts do change when we receive new information. And people that are um, kind of on the fence or on the other side of the argument will probably use that to um, as their own argument, right? That uh, if we can't have stable numbers from one day to the next, or if this data could change like that and everything we knew about a subject is completely different, then how can we trust science? Um, I guess what I would say in response to that is, it's because of that, even though it can be to its detriment, that um, we can trust science, right? Like Because we're always questioning ourselves and we're always questioning what we know is reality. It means if we decided back when the smallpox came out that if you didn't get the vaccination, you were gonna turn into a cow-human hybrid and then it was never proven otherwise, we'd still be thinking these things. So it's kind of comforting, but at the same time, um, it can make people feel a bit scared to trust science because it can change. I, I'm wondering if maybe a good solution is just trying to train ourselves for that instability and to understand that our views could be challenged at some point. Thank you, Amanda, for lots of good information. I'm Mary Shillington. Um, and I'm, I want you to, to um, talk about emotions and values because it seems to me around the whole vaccine thing for COVID and for other things like that, the emotions and the values of my own freedom and that kind of stuff really affected how people responded to that. So could you comment on that? Absolutely, and yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, our emotions can be such a strong pull in how we believe in things. And so um, I guess what we kind of tell people is if you're trying to, let's use a vaccination as an example. Say you have a family member you love and you want to get them vaccinated. It doesn't, ma like, doesn't matter how you all believe personally. Let's just do this as an experiment. Um, if you're having a lot of difficulty, they found if you can actually appeal to those emotions and find out their reasoning and their personal, like what drives them to have such a strongly held belief, then you might be able to, in some cases, not use our emotions against them, that sounds sinister, but uh, use the good of the emotion and the feeling um, to, with your facts, to maybe guide them in a better direction. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, you've been talking a lot about AI and about the internet and that. I'm a little, quite a bit more interested in an older technology, an older medium, because what I'm seeing in the last, and this is really anecdotal, but I've been running across print material that's left in um, restaurants on the highway, places like that, you know. Uh, you'll go in and then there's always, there's usually a ma uh, the local paper and then a bunch of other advertising stuff sitting there by the, by the till. What I've been seeing the last little while are these things, they're well printed, um, nothing, out of the ordinary, but they're, the ones I'm seeing are really still anti-vax, the whole, that they're running that whole thing. And there's a, there's a network of that stuff that shows up, in my experience, at least across the highways of Southern Alberta. And do you um, have anything to say about that? Um, yeah, we've definitely, like I, I know the sort of um, media you're talking about, and we definitely would still give you similar advice on, like, if you were trying to say, I mean, obviously most of them are so obvious that the normal person would see the flaws in it, but uh, we do try to make 
our information work across mediums. Like It's not as common as digital any longer, but it is still very much a problem, and it's harder to disprove, right? Because normally we're checking our sources, we're doing all these things digitally, and if it's a flyer that you find in a, a coffee shop or a truck stop, you can't check your sources. And if they are doing a good job of imitation, it can be even harder. So like, I, I don't know that we have any great solutions, but I guess just really, really knowing your information. So if someone you love is trying to present these to you, you can gently guide them in a better direction. Because yeah, they're not, this isn't a great answer, I'm sorry, but it's just uh, we don't do nearly as much in that realm at the moment. So that's sort of all I could really offer on that one. Hi, Leona Jacobs. So um, I guess my, my question is for you to perhaps um, speak to the issue of gaslighting. Because I feel that that's one of the things that get people turned around and perhaps not being subtle to do the sort of six step or five step process, so. Uh, well, the term gaslighting, which for anyone who's not familiar is basically when someone tries to prove to you that the reality you're understanding is not right. Uh, typically, it's often used in abusive relationships, but it can be used in a lot of arenas to cause the person to doubt themselves. And I mean, it's a terrible tactic. And I don't know that, I don't know that we really ha have actually ever covered it properly. Um, but it is a good point that there are obviously going to be occasions where you, and it might not even be through gaslighting, but there are going to be a bunch of different occasions where you don't have the time to stop and critically analyze everything. And I think in those instances, like say that happened to you and then you realize after the fact that that's not right, you just have to give yourself compassion because misinformers are so good at what they do and they are so slick and some of them, like we can't tell them apart. So I think, yeah, like, Tactics like that are awful, um, but if you do find that you've gotten sucked up in something like this, just self-compassion is the most important thing. Thanks, man. My name is Brooke Cully. Um, so there's true science, proven science, peer-reviewed science. What happens when science itself polarizes a debate just because of truth? My example is two examples, I guess. First example would be genetically modified foods, which in the political realm the left was against. And the other was stem cell research, which the politically right was against. But they're exactly the same thing. So I guess my question is, how can, how can science define political boundaries around the information? I, I don't know if I... That's a very interesting question. Um, so technically science is supposed to be unbiased, but sometimes scientific findings or scientific developments can definitely tie into a certain political leaning. And I know that the scientists I work with are they do their best to be unbiased, and they try, if they know they might have a personal bias, they, they try to present that in a truthful way so people can have the full picture. It doesn't always happen, and I'm not saying every scientist is honest, because we've all seen the mad scientist in the movies, and yeah, but um, yeah, I, I think that science tries real hard to stay out of politics and sometimes gets dragged in, but it's sort of not where it belongs because I feel like one should be based entirely on facts, but then some of those facts could influence people's personal feelings. Uh, so it's kind of a, a tricky, a tricky area, I think. Hi, David Major. <clears throat> uh, I have a bit of a personal question for you. What? are the sources of information that are available to you that you, your first instinct is to trust? And only after a great deal of thought would you say, 
I really need to question that because it's, I, I mean, if, well, answer that question. <laughs> I love that one, uh, especially since I'm not a scientist by nature. When I started at Science Up First, like I'm a comedian and an artist. Uh, and I just got really lucky to find my dream job because I love everyone there so much. But <laughs> that means when I started there, I wasn't checking my sources and I wasn't doing good research and I was believing a lot of things that were not true. Uh, I don't actually know, now that I've been so altered by science up first, if I trust anything fully. I would say, <laughs> I would say um, from what I've seen, I do believe if something comes from the CIHR, it's going to be to the best of their knowledge. I don't think it's flawless. Uh, and they do try to, so uh, if anyone's forgotten, that's the Canadian Institution of Health Research. Um, they will typically tell us if they're giving us information that they don't fully understand yet. And so um, I, I like sources that do admit what they don't know. Uh, and so for me, if I'm seeing someone out there that's like claiming they have all the answers and, and they don't really seem to or they seem a little bit like a snake oil salesperson, uh, that's going to make me question, but yeah, now that I, I work for Science Up First, I trust very few people. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I enjoyed your, your talk today. Uh, I'm Wayne Tedder. I have a question on, not a question, but a statement really on, the, you had a list of debugging steps that could go through. Okay, sorry. Um, my question is, uh, is there education extending down into elementary or secondary institutions on identifying these critical thinking type of approaches to information that they hear? That's a good question. Yeah, so um, there is some. Uh, we have found that, uh, I think it's uh, Media Smarts. Media Smarts is one of the really fantastic websites. And it's not exclusively for school aged children, but uh, a lot of their content is. Or it's for caretakers of school aged children on how to address so many different types of misinformation because especially kids now, right? They're exposed to so much through social media. Uh, we do, we really want to get to planning our own information package so we can kind of make sure we have all the stuff that we really approve of. But Media Smarts is where we usually send people. Or the Cranky Uncle game that I mentioned earlier is fantastic for training kids that are, I think, the, I can't remember what the low end of the age is. It might be eight, but it might be about 10. Uh, but yeah, those are some really good resources in the meantime while we figure everything out at Science Up first. Kristen, am I allowed a second yeah. crack at it? <laughs> uh, my question uh, relates to uh, all the trolls that surf the uh, internet. Are you aware of any uh, any of them being paid by groups or political parties? Anyone in particular? Do, have, you, have you come across any examples of people actually getting paid to spread that crap? <laughs> that is another excellent question. Um, I personally haven't heard of any like political parties or anyone that has any affiliations with troll farms. But trolling is so bad that we have two people on our staff whose sole job it is to deal with trolls. And I did learn through them that the troll farms do pay large numbers of people for you know, various whoever it's in their best interest to spread this sort of stuff. So yes, people are paid to do this, but I'm not sure by whom. Same, number two. <laughs> um, Henning Wendell again. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> um, and it relates to um, misinformation through, you say, impersonation, perhaps 
those people posing as experts d may be expert in another area, but not the area that they're touted to be experts in, so we probably should properly call them charlatans as far as that goes. But in many cases, such people that are impersonating or providing information are maybe only providing partial information, and in many cases, that partial information by itself may be quite true, but it gives misinformation if we think that's the whole. Yeah, that's a really great point. So that's um, another kind of cherry picking example right there is just choosing what you want and throwing the rest away. It's uh, why some science communicators, if you see them on social media, will try to get all of their information into like one to two slides. Uh, it's terrible for reading, but it does mean that people can cherry pick a lot less. Uh, but it's a huge problem and it's definitely, like that falls under the malinformation kind of area. And it is definitely a tactic that a lot of misinformers use. Thank you so much, Amanda. Could I get another round of applause for our incredible speaker today? Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with all of us about misinformation in the digital age. I just want to remind everyone next week is Kennyism, Jason Kenny's pursuit of power. And before we put all of our coats on, I just I would like to invite Amanda up to just give us a small takeaway as we go about our days and enjoy um, the beautiful winter. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, well, first of all, I would really like to thank everyone because this is the first time I've ever done my own uh, anti-misinformation talk. I do all the other stuff at Science Up First, but I really wanted to try this out and you have all been fantastic. Uh, Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Basically, we try really hard at Science Up First to be compassionate with ourselves and with everyone else, to try to come from a place of believing that most people that share in misinformation or quote misinformation, they don't have bad intentions. Most people, they just get caught up in it. So um, I guess really listen to your guts, be nice to everybody, and yeah, kind of bone up on how you can spot when something is not true. Thank you. You did it. 10 out of 10.